All right, good morning. So I'm going to be talking on pediatric elbow fractures this morning. So, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, pediatric elbow fractures this morning. Um, we're going to talk about ages 2 to 12. Um, the talk this morning, we're not going to cover nursemaid's elbow, simple dislocations, montagias, neonatal fractures, or adolescent fractures. Those are um, kind of separate topics. We're really talking about uh, prepubescent uh, skeletal injuries to the elbow here. I'm going to show some CTs and MRIs in the talk this morning. Um, they're really just for teaching purposes, and I don't want you to um, think that by seeing them in the talk this morning that you really need them for the diagnosis or management of these injuries. So the fractures that we'll talk about are, we're going to talk about supracondylar humerus, lateral condyle, radial neck, medial, medial pacondyle, and then lastly, we'll talk about medial condyle fractures. Although they're rare, you do need to know about them. So what what's so different about the pediatric elbow? You know, um, here I've got a series of uh, femur fractures and femur healing that we see here in a newborn. This is a, a birth injury, and you can see how much remodeling occurs, right? I mean, if you look from the bottom left to the bottom right, you see how displaced this fracture is. You get a ton of callus, and then four months later, it looks like you know nothing, nothing has happened. And the reason is there's really limited remodeling of the elbow compared to other pediatric fractures. So here is a comparison between um, a, a newborn elbow here and an adult elbow. And you see what's so different is the absence of what's in, you know, the red uh, circle there. You know, you just don't see any of the ossified structures about the elbow. You know, to see what's there, uh, you have to do an MRI or an arthrogram. And so here's an MRI of a, of a pediatric elbow, and you can see you really how different it is. And the, uh, you know, the main thing is the, um, the, the distal humerus here is, is cartilaginous. So on the x-ray that you see here on the left, all you're going to see is this ossified um, ossification center here. This is of the capitellum. You can see how that looks on the MRI, a little fleck of radial head here. And um, the rest of it is all cartilaginous. So all those parts are actually still there. You just can't see them on the, the plane films. So another way of seeing what's there is what's called an arthrogram. So here's an arthrogram. We put a needle in. Um, so my favorite way to in inject the elbow is not through the soft spot that's traditionally taught in the textbooks, but really just to go in the midline of the distal brachium, just go straight posterior and drop right in the olecranon fossa. And then once we inject the dye, you can see that the dye goes into the joint space and then when we bring it back to the AP, it'll outline the articular surfaces of the elbow. And then you'll be able to see. So here we can actually see the outline of the distal humerus. Um, this is a lateral condyle fracture. And we can see that the articular surface here is actually um, without any step off. So going back, though, just to some basic anatomy. The, the ossification center is what's traditionally taught is C-R-M-T-L-O or has this acronym, Come Rub My Tummy of Love, which is a helpful way to remember this. And this is the order in which they appear. And um, roughly, it's every two years, uh, capitellum, radial head, medial pacondyle, trochlea, olecranon, and lateral pacondyle. So you can look at an x-ray of a scuttling mature child and roughly predict how old the kid is based solely on which ossification centers are present. So they kind of go... Um, uh, around the clock, you've got the uh, uh, capitellum, which starts out, and then the radial head, you know, comes about age four. Uh, medial pacondyle, um, here is labeled I for internal, that's the European nomenclature. The trochlea, and then the olecranon ossification center, and then lastly, the lateral pacondyle, here is labeled an E for external, that again, that's the European nomenclature. And so based on the um, the age of the, the, the kid, it will be what you can actually see on plain films. There's that acronym again, come rub my tummy of love. So um, as we said, you can really predict when these um, accessory growth centers uh, come based on the age of the child. Um, capitellum at two years, radial head, medial pacondyle and trochlear, lecranon, lateral pacondyle, about every two years uh, thereafter. Slightly more delayed in boys, Boys, sometimes we say three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, um, but there's obviously some variability from uh, from kid to kid.
So let's go over some cases. I think probably the best way to really understand pediatric elbow fractures is to go through in sort of a case-based approach. So here we have a seven-year-old boy who falls off a tire swing. He's got immediate pain, comes in with a swollen elbow. So if we look here on this, uh, this AP and lateral, you know, we can see that um, on the AP, um, you know, it looks relatively well aligned. If you look at the cortex here, there's a little break in this lateral cortex, a little break in the medial cortex. But really, when we look at the lateral projection that we see the abnormality here. So the key thing you want to look at on the lateral is this, this called anterior humeral line. So if you draw a line down the anterior cortex of the humerus as it comes down, it should always intersect the capitellum here. You can see as we draw this line and drop it down, that it doesn't intersect the capitellum. And that's because the, the humerus is, is, is actually um, uh, fractured and hinged uh, backwards. So this is a type 2 supracondylar humerus fracture. Supracondylar humeruses are the most common type of elbow fracture. Uh, for all comers, it's about 60%. Um, overall, it's about 30% of all um, limb fractures in children less than seven years old. And the classic mechanism is the fall on the outstretched hand or the so-called foosh, which leads to hyperextension of the elbow. What actually happens is, is during uh, extension, the electronon engages with the um, electronon fossa. And then as the elbow continues to hyperextend, it fractures right through that weak area of bone, that thin area of bone uh, in the supracondylar region. And here is again how this, how this occurs. The electronon engages the electronon fossa, and then it just snaps off right there. So treatment is, is challenging. You know, close reduction techniques are difficult. Um, you're really trying to balance like these two knife blades, right? This real thin piece of bone in the supracondylar region. Um, oftentimes, you know, these need to be treated with percutaneous pinning. Uh, I'm not going to go into full detail about which type twos you can treat uh, in a cast and which ones you cannot. Um, that can be a journal club for another day. But uh, often these are treated with a closed reduction under general anesthesia. Um, there's very little role for ER management of these, um, really only in those type 2As, which again is, is another topic. Um, percutaneous pinning uh, will hold that reduction there so that you can actually extend the elbow. In the old days, they would do the closed reduction and then cast them in some hyperflexion. Unfortunately, that has a real high complication rate with developing Volkman's contracture because it cuts off the the blood supply to the forearm and, and with catastrophic outcomes. And so percutaneous pinning was invented essentially so that you could get the close reduction, put your two pins in, and then cast the elbow in extension to avoid the complications of uh, treating in hyperflexion. So sometimes we do these on an outpatient basis. That's really sort of what the new um, development is and the management of these uh, type 2 supracondylar humerus fractures. Um, you can really do them up to three or four days afterwards. If they come in on a Tuesday night, it's reasonable to put them on for Thursday. And so um, that's really sort of where we're moving. Uh, let's look at a couple more because this really is a, a common injury and it's important to have a full understanding of the spectrum of injury. So uh, here is a very uh, non-displaced one. You can see here that anterior humeral line is intact, but there's still what's so sometimes called the sale sign here, where you can see this elevation of the fat pad posteriorly, elevation of the fat pad anteriorly, and that's indicative that there's a intraarticular um, bleeding that's pushed the normal fat pads that reside in the uh, lecranon fossa and in the coronoid fossa, it's pushed them up and out of place such that it gives a little bit of a lucency on the plane film. So this is a type one supracondylar. Um, here is a type two, very similar to our case example from previously. You can see that anterior humeral line is disrupted. It's also got that big elbow effusion, big fat pad sign as well. This is treated with close reduction and pinning, as you can see here. So here's a more severely involved one. This is a kid who has a big ecchymosis over the intermedial aspect of the elbow, um, marked deformity, as you can see, you know, that sort of dinner fork looking deformity. And here's her x-ray, and this is a widely displaced uh, supracondylar humerus fracture. So this is treated with a closed reduction and pinning. Here we'll walk through the fluoro steps. Um, start with after the kids under general anesthesia. I always like using an endotracheal tube for these so that you can get some paralysis. Uh, pull traction, line it up in the AP, and then flex the elbow up. 
you can see with the elbow and hyperflexion, it comes into reduction here. Making sure that you've got your alignment and then two pins placed from the lateral side um, is typically sufficient for the majority of these. Um, this one was unstable, so we're adding a medial pin here. Um, and we've got some other techniques on our YouTube channel about uh, pin placement. Uh, certainly the, uh, the, the video that we have on super common humerus fractures has a bit more detail about pin placement. Here's one placed from the medial side, though. Starts on the medial pecondyle and then driving it up on the lateral to add stability here. And here's the final construct with that. Pins are bent here outside the skin. One of the keys when you're doing these, you really want to make sure you leave plenty of pin outside the skin. These will swell a lot. I've seen pins that are cut short here end up getting incarcerated or buried underneath the skin. So uh, postoperatively, pins are typically taken out at three weeks. I put in my notes uh, 21 to 28 days. and um, That makes the staff, if they can't find an appointment with you right at three weeks, kind of know where you want them to be between that 21 and 28, not really at 17 days. Uh, there's pretty good studies that show that kids don't need therapy afterwards. I don't put them in a cast or brace after the pins come out. It's really unnecessary. You know, the risk of refracture is really quite minimal, and they don't really need any additional protection beyond that. There's actually a good study that showed that uh, supervised therapy, all it does is lead to more time missed from school for the kid, more time missed from work for the parents, and higher anxiety levels. So remember, children are not little adults. Um, we've got a whole separate talk on how children are fundamentally different than adults. But the bottom line is they don't need therapy after elbow fractures. Their uh, range of motion will come back with time. I actually have these kids all just follow up on an as needed basis. We go over some of the anticipatory guidance at the uh, visit where we pull the pins out. Uh, but kids don't need to come back for range of motion checks or x-ray checks. The recovery is very predictable, um, and it just doesn't really need ongoing medical monitoring. Complications, fortunately, are rare, uh, but they are well described, and you take care of a lot of them, and you'll see them. They include uh, vascular injuries as well as nerve palsies. Um, so here's a case. This is a radial nerve that's uh, caught in the fracture site. You can see it's being extracted here. Um, here's a case where you've got the median nerve in the blue vessel loop here that's gone right into the fracture site. This kid had an associated brachial artery injury. Um, you can see here's a close-up of that median nerve right in the middle of that fracture site. So there's a lot of controversy regarding how to manage the pulseless Supercondylar, supercondylars with nerve injuries. Again, that's not really the focus of our talk today. Um, you can read about that on your own. Uh, but just know that um, this can be a, a, a very um, high stress situation when you've got a child with a threatened limb um, or a nerve palsy. This is an arterial injury I took care of a couple of years ago. This is what that looks like. So essentially, you know, the bone as it fractured came through and sort of kind of bluntly cut right through the brachial artery here. Uh, this was actually treated with vein graft, and the kid ended up doing great. So complications from the management of these elbow injuries, um, you know, the whole goal of our modern treatment is to avoid these complications. Fortunately, they're largely historical with modern uh, treatment, but it is important to know, you know, what those, you know, imminent threats are. Uh, cubitus varus, which you see here in this picture um, for this kid, is the deformity that they tend to fall into if they're untreated. We see these when we go on mission trips. They're very rare, though, in in uh, our clinic and our culture and society today. Um, hyperextension deformities where the elbow is uh, you know, hyperextended, uh, that's the position that it'll heal in um, if it's not treated with a closed reduction. Um, they do always heal, by the way. I mean, these don't really go on to non-union. And so really what you're avoiding with surgical treatment is you're avoiding the secondary deformities. Uh, nerve injuries are a real complication, especially with medial pins. We've largely mitigated that with the technique of making a medial incision and uh, dropping right down onto the bone. Uh, but it is a uh, still a concern. You can actually get nerve injuries from lateral pins as well as they come across and capture the medial cortex. Uh, probably the, some of the worst complications, though, are unrecognized nerve injuries where they're trapped in bone. The median nerve is notorious for doing this. Um, you saw some some of those pictures earlier, how it can really get between the fracture fragments. And if that's treated uh, without some techniques to get those nerves out, they can end up with um, incarceration in the bone. That's a real tough problem to come back from. Unrecognized vascular injury um, can lead to loss of blood flow, compartment syndrome, and, and ultimately loss of limb if it's not managed appropriately. Uh, again, there's whole algorithms um, and um, 
instructional course lectures on how to manage the pulseless supracondylar. Needless to say, I think the bottom line is that um, when you're done managing these injuries at the end of the night, you got to be sure that there's blood flow back to the limb. So we'll move on to uh, some other types of elbow fractures. So this next case is a four-year-old boy that got bounced too hard by a big kid on a trampoline. This is just a lesson that whenever big kids and little kids play together, it's always the little kids that get hurt. Uh, but here we got a very different ecchymosis pattern. It's all on the lateral side now. Not as much swelling, just that ecchymosis on the posterior lateral aspect of the elbow. And here's that injury. So this is a lateral condyle fracture. And you can see here that disruption of that lateral cortex. And so um, sometimes these get seen at urgent cares because there's just not as much swelling. And they get a little underappreciated. Some call them just chip fractures or avulsion fractures. Um, but we know that it, it actually involves the whole lateral condyle. Um, if we look at this cartoon here, you can see that that fracture line, although it comes down here, typically exits down into the cartilaginous portion of the elbow. And it's that whole lateral condyle that's off. And so when you look at this x-ray, remember what we talked about in the anatomy section, that there's there's a lot more here that you just don't see. And so if we look at this drawing this helps you to really appreciate and understand that it's the entire lateral condyle that's fractured. It's not just a chip and it's not just an avulsion. Lateral condyles are common. Um, they uh, represent anywhere from you know, 12 to 17% of, of all comers. It's an intraarticular fracture. It can easily be missed. And remember, it's not a chip fracture. Um, some are not so subtle. Here we've got the entire lateral condyle that's fractured and kind of flipped out of the joint, sort of rotating on the lateral collateral ligaments. It's completely flipped out. Uh, almost all of these require surgery. Some of the uh, non-displaced ones can be managed without. Again, that's a whole other subject area that we're not going into this morning. Uh, but just know that lateral condyle fractures are kind of the snake in the grass. You know, they can really be problematic and they can look rather innocuous, especially on first glance. The mechanism of it is a little uncertain. There's two main theories, this sort of push-pull mechanism. One is that with this valgus load, it, it shears off uh, the piece. The other um, is thought to be a varus load where you've got a pulling of the fragment and it, uh, and it, it kind of pops it off there. Either way, um, a lot of these are treated with closed reduction and percutaneous pinning or open reduction with percutaneous pinning. And uh, some authors have described the uh, ORIF technique with screws, which has its own benefits. So here is one of these cases that's managed. This is, uh, you can see in the preoperative fluoro here, you can see the, uh, the fracture line coming down through that lateral condyle. Here's the arthrogram. And really the purpose of the arthrogram is to check the distal humeral articular surface. And you're looking for what sometimes I call that gull wing sign, where you want a smooth line here of the distal articular surface to ensure that there's not any displacement of that fragment or, or opening up. Uh, for the uh, lower grade injuries, they'll have an intact cartilaginous hinge. This, this articular cartilaginous hinge will be intact and that'll maintain the articular reduction because the articular surface isn't actually injured. So this is treated with two pins, uh, similar type of aftercare. Uh, here is an older kid. As you can see, there's a lot more ossification. You can see, um, you know, the you look at the capitellum. You have radial head. You have metapacondyle. You've got trochlea, and you've got lecranon. So this kid is uh, older, right? Um, there is even ossification of the lateral pacondyle. So this kid is going to be 10 to 12 years old. So this is treated with internal fixation. So. You know, one of my mentors used to say, why don't you follow up these pins with a couple of cannulated screws? And that's exactly what we did here. You know, these are two cannulated screws. The, um, the advantage of these is that you don't have pins outside the skin. You can get them moving right away. Older kids, especially these sort of preteens, will get a little bit stiff on you. And so it's nice to be able to get them moving a little earlier. One thing I always find amusing with these is that your screw heads never look like they're down. They look like they're floating out in space. And of course, the reason for that is because there's still a lot of cartilage on this piece that this actually, when you're looking directly at it with your eyeballs and you're putting the the washer of this screw down, uh, when you see it hit, you know, what you think is bone, there's actually this rim of cartilage still around there. But that's why these screw heads look like they're floating, why they look like they're not actually uh, all the way down. Post-operative protocol is very similar, uh, cast off and pins out at that three to four weeks at 21 to 28 days. 
Same thing with if you're using screws, go ahead and get the cast off at three weeks. We know that lateral condyles are very slow to get their range of motion back. There's a great figure um, that I use in my post-operative note to show the families how there's that sort of slow um, recovery of range of motion with time. Families, grandmothers, they just need to be counseled on a couple of things. Number one, the kids are slow to get their range of motion back. And secondly, they always get this big lateral bump. And this is part of the anticipatory guidance you want to do at your three-week post-op visit is you want to let them know that, hey, it, it's going to be a while until Junior gets his range of motion back. And, oh, by the way, he's going to have this lump on the outside of his elbow. Can you tell parents what is going to happen? Not only do you come across sounding like you're prophetic, but also it reduces the uh, number of phone calls and the anxiety the parents have. Remember, parents are very worried creatures, right? They're just, they're just highly emotional creatures. You know, they love their kids, but they're not medical experts. And small things just get them all worked up. Things like an elbow that doesn't move. Things like a kid that walks funny or things like a bump that grows on the outside of the elbow. So your ability to anticipate these things when they're a normal part of healing, tell the family about it beforehand. It will be a much appreciated anti-anxiety maneuver. So why do we operate on these lateral condyles? Well, here's why, right? So here's a six-year-old female comes in with this sort of, quote, minimally displaced elbow fracture, diagnosed in one of these urgent cares, put in a cast for six weeks, which, by the way, is probably more than you need, comes in, she's got elbow pain, and her range of motion is this 30-degree arc. And now we have a real problem, right? So she's got this displaced lateral condyle fracture. The whole thing is shifted, and she's stiff, and she's already been treated now for six weeks. So this is a non-union. This is a lateral condyle non-union. And again, you know, children will always make you look good. They do not heal everything. Um, you know, a unstable interarticular fracture, that's going to go on to a non-union. It doesn't matter how good your biology is. So here's that fracture. You know, it's obviously displaced. The CT scan demonstrates that. Um, and the complications of non-union is that the lateral condyle, you know, gets cut off from its blood supply. It fails to grow. And you get this progressive cupidus valgus and a tardy ulnar nerve palsy. So here's a woman who um, came in to see us in clinic. She'd emigrated from um, outside the United States. She's got this um, uh, contracture, as you see here. She's got this valgus deformity that you see here. And, of course, she's got numbness in her ring and small fingers because she's got this nerve palsy. And here's her x-ray. So she has this chronic non-union. You can see she already has, you know, arthrosis that's occurred here at the radio capitellar joint. You've got beaking of the radial head, and there's that big non-union, and she developed this valgus deformity. You can see she's grown into valgus here, right? So this is a congruent ulnar humeral joint, but it's in, what, 30 degrees of valgus? Um, this is a tough problem, right? I mean, she is a bit in the young side for an elbow replacement. She's got... Um, uh, ulnar nerve palsy because it's being stretched here over the medial side, limited range of motion, and now she has elbow pain. So, you know, we're, 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 we're taking care of this lateral condyle on the seven-year-old, not so that the seven-year-old will heal, not so she can play gymnastics again, but so that she can have a lifetime of function out of the elbow that she was born with. So that, that's really part of what it's our job to do as pediatric specialists is think about what, what's actually best for this individual, not the child, but the individual over the course of their lifetime. Again, parents will be very focused on, oh, she's so active. I want to be able to play sports. But it's your job to think beyond that and know what's the best thing for this child over the course of their life and what thing needs to be done now that's going to give them the best elbow, skeleton, limb, hand, whatever for life. Not for now, but for life. So, um, Let's move on to another case. Um, this is a 10-year-old boy that got pushed off the slide by a girl. I can't make these up, by the way. I mean, this is actually what occurred. So uh, here he is, and he has this injury here to his radial head neck. So this is a radial neck fracture. A lot of times they're called radial head fractures, but they're almost always radial neck fractures. Um, it's a, a common elbow fracture in children. You'll see them uh, plenty. Um, most of them occur in slightly older kids. They're not really the little littles but the sort of 9 to 12 age age range. And the um, the injury occurs right here at the neck. Um, they're, they're actually usually Salter Harris 2s of the proximal radius. If you look very closely here, you can see that there's actually, this is actually metaphysis and the physical injuries here. And then this is your big um, 
uh, fragment there that's actually your Selter Harris too. So some call them radial head, some call them radial neck. In children, mostly they're Salter Harris twos of the proximal radius, but it's all the same injury. So uh, some you can treat without surgery. These do have some capacity to remodel. They're an exception to the rule we talked about earlier. And um, the injury is thought to be sort of that same push-pull mechanism. That's really how Salter Harris twos occur is with some pull, some push, you know, some tension failure, some compression failure. So it's that, that combined injury. And largely what, what we teach is that the treatment algorithm is, is based on angulation. With, you know, 30 degrees can be treated with observation. 60 need a closed reduction. 90 often need an open reduction. Although there are some advanced techniques that can be used to try to avoid an open reduction, a percutaneous assist reduction. Um, again, here's that 30, 60, 90 algorithm. 30 degrees will remodel if you've got more than two years of growth remaining, which your typical 10-year-old does. 60 degrees needs that closed reduction. And at 90, you got to think about whether it's going to need an open reduction. So here is a, uh, a technique that I like using. This is a... Um, uh, close reduction in the operating room. I, you probably recognize that thumb. Um, but here is really the, the powerful you know, tool. So this is a pin, not on a wire driver, but just in the hand of the surgeon here that's introduced at this super steep angle, right intrafocally, right into the fracture site. And then it's lined up on the AP, it's lined up on the lateral, and then you just bend the ever-loving stink out of it. You just pull it right through the skin and soft tissue so that it levers that radial head up and over. Typically bend that pin, throw it away, get yourself another one. And then once you get it lined up, you can do it again. Get that pin. You're going to walk it down the neck of the radius so it drops in the fracture site. And then... Sorry, I'm going to go through it again. So you're going to walk it down again. This is the new pin. I've already thrown away one bent pin. New pin, get it into the fracture site, lever it up, push, 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 push. Again, this is with, with hands, not with a wire driver. And then once it's in, these are typically stable. There it is in the cast. Kid goes on to union. You can see all the periosteal reaction here at the neck. Um, excellent reduction, well-aligned radial head here pointing towards the capitellum. You have all this periosteal reaction at the proximal radius. Kid ended up doing great. Um, so here's another one, a little bit more severe injury. A uh, 10-year-old boy fell off a play kitchen. This was my first couple of years of practice. And you can see here, wah, 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 he has this terrible radial head fracture where um, it's now flipped 90 degrees I mean, technically, you could call it dislocated because that's the articular surface down here. It belongs right up there. Um, this is what it looked like at open reduction. You know, we're looking right at that radial head. Get it back into place here. This is stabilized with the retrograde intramedullary nail that starts down at the radial styloid um, or Lister's tubercle. It's run retrograde and then just sort of wedged up into that radial head to hold it there. He ended up... Uh, having a little bit of collapse, the radial uh, pin ended up becoming, a uh, nail ended up becoming prominent, take it out. And you guys ended up going on to union though. All right, so we'll move on, do a couple more while we still have a little bit more time. So we have a 10 year old boy here that fell off a trampoline um, and we can see there is a medial pecondyle fracture. So this is the medial pecondyle. This is sort of this funny looking oblique. And I show it to you because this is the x-rays you actually get when you're taking care of children. You know, don't ask for an AP and a lateral. I hope you like two obliques. So try to get good at making x-rays based, try to get good at making diagnoses based on the x-rays that you get. You know, like I think uh, Sherman said, you go to war with the armor you have, not the armor you want. So sometimes you make decisions based on the x-rays you have, not the x-rays you want. But anyway, you can see here, this is the medial pecondyle. Again, an older kid. Look at all these ossification centers that are matured. But this obviously belongs up here. I don't care what x-ray you get. The medial pecondyle should come right off of that medial column. And this is obviously not. And if you look here on this view, you know, that's your medial pecondyle right here inside of the elbow joint. So this is sometimes what's called an incarcerated medial pecondyle fracture. It's associated with dislocation. What happens is the whole medial pecondyle travels into the joint. And this is essentially how it occurs. This is a fluoro shot of this injury. And you can see with, with 90 degrees of valgus injury as the elbow dislocates, the medial collateral ligament is going to kind of 
pop off that medial epicondyle, and then it travels down into the joint, and that's how it becomes incarcerated because at the time of reduction, the medial epicondyle kind of gets caught in the joint, and then that's how it ends up there. And there it is. So there, there, here, here's your perfect lateral now, right? So you can see that that's the medial epicondyle trapped in the joint. So this is treated with an open reduction, you know, make an incision on the medial side, get that fragment, get it reduced and put a screw in it. This is just a single 4-0 cannulated screw, um, nice and short so as to capture this metaphyseal bone right there. And uh, this kid went on to union really without any difficulty. Next case, six-year-old girl falls off this bunk bed. So um, if you think this is a funny looking x-ray, then you're right. It is a funny looking x-ray. So this is actually also a dislocation. You can see that the radial head is not pointed to the capitellum and the uh, uh, electronon here is sort of behind the distal humerus. So this was treated somewhere else with a closed reduction. This was thought to be an elbow dislocation. It was treated with a closed reduction. The guy did an arthrogram here. Has a ton of exit of contrast on the medial side. Kid comes back at 10 week follow up and we've got an x-ray that looks like this. So this is a problem. Um, you got the radial head. It does not line up with the capitellum. And you have something over here that doesn't really belong. You know, gets a CT scan. You know, shows this big piece over on the uh, medial side. Kid ends up coming back at a year with a referring doctor saying, you know, not normal function, no pain. This is, this is a missed medial condyle fracture. That's what this is. You can see the entire elbow actually dislocates with the fragment. You know, that's really sort of the, the, the shame here is the whole fragment is, is kind of gone up, you know, proximal medially, and then the elbow just ends up following it. And so that's why the whole thing is dislocated. Yeah, maybe the kid's doing fine now because she's seven or he's seven, uh, but this is not going to be a good elbow in the long term. So... Um, here's the fluoro in office. You can see, I mean, that that's the range of motion. Um, that's terrible, right? 30 degree arc of motion. So that's a missed medial condyle fracture. I want to show you how we you know, how we catch them here. So this is a seven year old girl falls off a bunk bed, and um, you can see has this you know ossified piece out here. Here it is on the AP. Here it is on the lateral. So that's actually the medial condyle out there because it's still attached to the whole rest of the medial condyle. This whole thing is fractured and flipped out of the joint. Here's the ladder on that. So we caught this medial condyle fracture, and here was our plan. Here we've got a drawing here. I think I made this one for the resident. So this is essentially the fragment, this whole medial side. Remember, that's your capitellum right there. This is your whole medial side, and that's the whole fragment that came off. Here was our pre-op plan for the screws, a couple of different options that we were going to uh, use. Uh, here's the open reduction as we go, and you can see here when we drop down on this fragment, it's totally flipped towards us, right? So th this is actually the epiphyseal component of the fracture, and then this is the articular surface, right? So that whole piece needs to be flipped back down in. We've got vessel loops around the median nerve anteriorly, the ulnar nerve posteriorly. Once we get that thing flipped and down in, we use two pins from the cannulated screw set to... Uh, temporarily pin it in place and then just like I was taught why don't you follow those pins up with some cannulated screws and sure enough that's what we did here's the one and here's the other there's your final construct ulnar nerve stays in its anatomic position back behind there here's our screws going in the medial condyle fracture and uh, this is a younger kid you know six or seven which is why these screws look like they're in nothing Right, they look like they're floating around in space because they're actually in the cartilaginous distal humerus. They're not in the ossified distal humerus. There's your AP. There's your lateral. So that's it. That is the end of the cases. We'll cover just a couple of uh, uh, boring things, unfortunately, before we finish up. Um, we touched on it earlier, you know, about whether or not uh, kids need therapy afterwards. You know, usually the ADLs for children is enough. They don't typically need you know, formal structured therapy. Remember, children are not little adults. They're fundamentally different creatures. And so they don't need the same things that grownups do, like having somebody monitor them while they're doing activity. Um, 
children are not little adults. It's not what you can see that hurts you. Um, it's what you can't see that'll hurt you the most. And in these cases, it's that cartilaginous distal humerus, what you don't readily see on the x-ray, the lateral condyle, the medial condyle. For the supracondylars, it's the nerve, it's the artery, right? Those are the things that'll end up hurting you. The pediatric elbow is not as forgiving as other regions. The limiting, um, the limiting factors are commonly, um, you know, the, the, the amount of growth around the elbow, that there's not as much remodeling. You know, most of these will do well. However, you still have to manage them appropriately. Uh, remember, the, uh, the, the practice of pediatric orthopedic surgery is the appropriate management of children. It's not simply, you know, doing nothing. Um, we've covered this in other talks about how children are fundamentally different. And, you know, you should view your job as a pediatric orthopedist, you know, kind of like a lifeguard, right? When you need to get in the pool, you need to be off that chair and you need to be in the pool. You need to be doing something. But by and large, you can just stay out of the water. Um, children will often do well without your intervention. Um, but when it's the correct time to jump in, you need to jump in and do something. Um, children will not always make you look good. You know, in the case of that missed medial condyle fracture and some of these other injuries, uh, they, they do not heal everything. They do not remodel everything. Um, and so just remember that the, the, the thing that you do here is going to follow that kid around for the rest of their life. It's your job to make sure that they've got a good, high quality um, skeleton or joint that's going to serve them well for 70 plus years. You know, that's really the objective here. And so uh, so with that, you know, you've heard me say in other talks, taking care of children is a joy. Um, it's one of the greatest joys you know, that you can have um, as a physician. Um, is taking care of an injured child who ultimately goes on to do well. Uh, but it does require thought and it does require diligence. So thank you very much.